Welcome back to another episode in the Beyond Addiction series. My name is Adrian Webster, and in a previous uh, program, I had made a promise which I intend to fulfill in this session. The promise was that I would share with you some of the guiding principles straight out of the scriptures that would be relevant to overcoming the problem of addiction. I discovered in my early experience that the Bible is indeed very relevant to the situations that we face in the 21st century. In this session, which I have entitled Keys to Success, Promises You Can Count On, we want to unpack some of the biblical principles that illustrate well-known principles that uh, other organizations combating addiction have formulated as part of the program for overcoming the problem of substance abuse and addiction. God's Word contains principles and promises for overcoming addiction. And by the way, if you are not particularly struggling with some sort of substance abuse or some sort of addiction, one thing you can be sure of is that every single one of us has some problem with sin in our lives. And these principles would apply to overcoming any basic problem of sin. Addiction is only one category within that broad definition of what it means to be having the problem of sin in our lives. Principle number one that we all must know and we must accept if we're going to have any uh, opportunity of overcoming addiction is that you can overcome. You know, it starts right there with a shift in mindset. We have, may have failed a thousand times. You may have reached a point in your experience where you are ready to just throw in the towel and to give it up because you've tried and you've tried and you've tried again, but you have been unable to overcome. You may have failed a thousand times, but if, we, if you are going to have victory, it's going to begin with a change in mindset that says it is possible, it is definitely possible to overcome. We find this principle illustrated for us in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 13, where it reads as follows. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. So number one, whatever you're facing in your life, whatever the substance abuse problem that you are struggling with, what you need to know first and foremost is that you can overcome, that it is not uncommon that what you're experiencing, there are others who have gone before you, and there are others who in a similar vein have gained the victory. I once met with a person at a drug rehabilitation center who was struggling with a certain substance. And I remember going in there and sharing my story with him and trying to encourage him a little bit and you know, just give him some hope that went beyond addiction to, to try and get him to, to keep pushing forward. And I remember after talking to him for a while, he sort of interrupted me. He said, Adrian, have you ever struggled with this drug? And this particular drug, whatever it was, was his drug of choice and the one that he was uh, messing around with a lot. I said to him, you know, I haven't done that particular drug. He said, well, then you can't help me. There's nothing you can do to help me. You, you don't understand what this is like. He, he was thinking that, that this was, uh, no one could possibly enter into his world. No one had experienced what he had experienced. And he was alone on this journey. But that Bible promise says that's not true. No temptation has overcome you, but such as is common to man. In other words, that whatever we're struggling with, there are others who have walked the road before us. There are others who have fallen before us. And in a similar vein, there are others who have overcome before us. Moreover, the assurance of our victory is based not on our abilities or our faithfulness. It is based on God's faithfulness. It says that no temptation can overtake you such as, but, as, but as is common to man, and God is faithful. I, you know, I really praise the Lord that, that, that my victory is secure because of who God is. It's not based on my vacillating nature, but that He is the one who will give me the victory. And He is faithful in my moments of weakness. He is faithful when I'm going through the valley of temptation. And because of His faithfulness, the promise says, He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. So whatever the temptation is that you're facing, number one, you can overcome. Number two, your security is rooted in the faithfulness of of God and not in your own strength and abilities. And number three, because of his faithfulness, he will not allow you to be placed in a temptation situation which you cannot beat, which comes back to principle number one, that you 
can overcome. Your mindset can change such that not because of my strength, because I failed by myself a thousand times, but because of his faithfulness and his ability, whatever I face, I can overcome. He is faithful and he will not let me be tempted beyond what I am able to bear in his strength. Principle number two is that we ought to be looking for God's escape route. When we find ourselves in a situation of temptation, when we find ourselves struggling with the old cravings and with the old way of life, the Bible says that if you come to the promises of God's word with faith and you realize what he's promising you, he has promised a way of escape. So the attitude of faith in the midst of temptation is not to give up and to give in, but the attitude of faith is to be looking because if the temptation has come, God has provided a way of escape to get out of that temptation. It says, also reading further in the book of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, it says that God will, with the temptation, also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So he is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able to. In other words, you can overcome. And then number two, that when you are in that situation of temptation, because of his promise again, if you're in temptation, he has already made a back door. He has already made an escape route. So when you find yourself there, what are you going to be doing? Are you going to be looking at the problem? Are you going to be you know, magnifying the situation you find yourself in? Are you going to be... you know? going on about how, uh, how challenging this is and how you, you, there's no way out. And No, if you're coming to the word of God with faith and you realize what God is promising you, then if you're in temptation, he has already made an alternative plan for you. He's already made the way of escape. So we are going to be looking for the way of escape, looking for the back door because we believe by faith it's there. If the temptation is there, so is the way of escape. Principle number three in terms of overcoming addiction is that you and I desperately need God's power. Now, we've mentioned this numerous times throughout our sessions so far in the Beyond Addiction series. You and I do not have the wherewithal in our own nature and in our strength. In fact, we are the ones that are responsible for our current state of affairs. We are the ones that have made the choices that have entrapped us. So if we're going to continue to rely upon our own strength, our own intelligence, our own abilities, that hole is just going to get deeper and deeper and the spiral is going to go more and more out of control. You and I have to come to a point in our experience where we realize everything I've tried has not helped me. It has not given me true victory or true success. I may have been able to shift the symptoms. I may have been able to move from this addiction to some other socially acceptable addiction. I may have been able to overcome a particular area only to swap it out for another area, but that's not true overcoming. That is simply shifting the symptoms. Now, this is very important to understand because I often meet people who want nothing to do with God. They, they, they don't believe that God can offer them anything. Yeah, they think that it's just a matter of positive thinking and positive reinforcement and talking to yourself in the mirror and you know, convincing yourself that, that you have what it needs and believing in yourself hard enough. Well, look, if you're at a point where you're not ready to let God into your life, let me just shortcut the process for you and let you know right up front, you are probably going to just keep on spiraling. As I say, maybe shifting the symptom from here to there, but that true sense of peace, that true sense of victory, that true overcoming power where you find true liberation, I'm going to share with you even from my own experience, you are only going to find that when you tap into God's power. When you come to Him and throw your weakness at His feet and your weak and broken humanity is combined with His strong and, and uh, almighty divinity. And then as those two merge together and He gives you the, the strength that you need, you will find true victory in your life. This is what it says in Scripture, well-known verse, Philippians 4, verse 13, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things that I thought was impossible. Now, what does that verse actually say? Is it saying I can do all things except overcome addiction? Does it say I can do all things and overcome most things except heroin? Does it say there that you would be able to gain victory over everything except cocaine maybe or the cigarettes that you're struggling with? That's not what that promise says, right? That promise says that if you are connected to Christ, if you are in Christ, if you are in that saving relationship, if you have made the choice and you've surrendered your life to Him, then He will give you the strength to overcome where you have never had strength to overcome before. You've tried all the self-help techniques. You've tried all the positive thinking. You've read all those, those books. You've, you've tried all the behavior modifications. You've, you've tried different philosophies and different ideas. None of them seem to be working. 
Why don't you give God a try? Why don't you invite Him into your life and put your faith in His promises? And through Christ, you will be able to do all things because He strengthens you. Notice that the Bible is constantly seeking to direct our attention away from ourselves, which is contrary to the, po the, 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 uh, the popular philosophies of today. Popular philosophies want to make man a god, want to find the, the inborn and the inbred divinity within us. That's the secret to salvation in the New Age philosophy. You have to realize who you are and realize what your potential is and release the divine being in in. Listen, you're the one that got yourself into the problem. So how is it that by convincing yourself that you are somehow God or you have somehow got some extraordinary powers, all of a sudden you're going to release yourself? It doesn't make any sense. And if you've tried that, you will know it is a bankrupt philosophy. It sounds nice on the outside, especially because it puts us at the center of our little selfish world, and it's all about me helping myself, and I don't have to rely on anyone else. But the fact of the matter is, you'll eventually reach a point where, you, where you'll understand and that in practice, that philosophy just doesn't hold any water. And Scripture, on the other hand, keeps telling us, look away from yourself. Realize you cannot do it in your own strength. You have to rely on somebody else. That somebody else is the God who came to give you your freedom. He came to set the captives free. And He will enable you to do all things pertaining to salvation, all things pertaining to the transformation that is so needed, if you will give your life to Him and align yourself with Him you will then find that you are complete in Him, that, that He is the one who will strengthen you. When we go to the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 16 to 17, we notice a similar concept coming through here. I say then, the Bible writer uh, writes, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what is the secret to overcoming the flesh? By the way, the flesh in Scripture is used all the way through as a, as a metaphor for this unconverted fallen nature, this place of weakness that you and I find ourselves in, this place of the inability to extricate ourselves from our addictions, from our sinfulness, from our weakness. He says, what is the solution to that? By unleashing the inborn divinity, by finding uh, you know, the Godhead uh, inside of your own mind, is it, is it about releasing some sort of energy or tapping into some unknown, non-personal force out there somewhere? Not at all. It's about going to a God who is living, who is real, who is a person, in whose image you and I were created. He gives us the Holy Spirit, which is the presence of divinity with us on earth today. He says here, if you walk in the Spirit, that is to say, if you walk hand in hand with the Holy Spirit, if you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life and you realize you cannot save yourself, you cannot get out of this by yourself, you need somebody to help you out of this. It's a little bit like you're walking along one day and somebody hasn't covered a manhole and all of a sudden you fall into this into this drain right there you know it wasn't covered up and whoop, you disappear down into the bottom you injure yourself it's smooth on the sides there's no way to get out what are you going to do you need someone who's walking by to reach down their hand or throw down a rope how, depending how deep it is you need someone to to reach down there and help pull you up. You got yourself into it. You weren't paying attention. You weren't looking where you were going. You were too busy doing other stuff. You were distracted. You weren't considering the big issues of life. You hadn't asked the right questions. Now you are in this pit. You've fallen into this manhole, this, this drainage system of sin and of addiction. How are you going to get out? Walk in the Spirit. Give yourself to the Lord. He will strengthen you. The Lord Jesus will strengthen you. The Holy Spirit will come into your life. And what happens when you're walking in the Spirit? You cannot fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit. The Spirit against the flesh. They're antagonistic to one another. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. You see, that's the problem we face. You and I are constantly drawn back into our old ways by the old man, by the old person, by the selfish desire, by, by, by the desire to satisfy the carnal nature. But when you have the Holy Spirit living through you, when you have the Holy Spirit giving you His mind and His strength, you are able to live above that nature which you were once formerly entrapped by. Another principle that you need to understand, which we've gone through in a, a, a number of other sessions, is you need new influences. How is that highlighted in the Bible? 
Well, here it says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What's that speaking about? That's saying that you and I need to make some conscious decisions about the influences we allow into our lives. Whether it's the movies we watch, whether it's the music we listen to, whether it's the friends we hang out with, whether it's the books we read, whatever it is, we need to be putting it through this biblical filter of evaluating whether it's something worthwhile investing the mental energy in, whether it's something worthwhile focusing our attention on, whether it's going to help us closer to God, help us closer to His kingdom, or draw us further further away. How does this apply to addiction? Because all those things there, it's saying surround yourself with positive influences. Surround yourself with influences that have positive spiritual impact in your life. Surround yourself with those things which are going to help you, that are going to focus your attention away from what you're trying to get out of, away from this thing that's pulling you down. In Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 2, we read something similar where it says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. You see, it makes a big difference where you place your attention. If you are planning for heaven, if you are planning to overcome, then you will make choices about the influences that surround you that will be in harmony with your new intended goal. You cannot say, I'm, I'm going to arrive at heaven, I'm going to arrive at victory, but I'm going to go in the opposite direction in terms of the influences in my life. So if your mindset has shifted, if you are no longer fixated on the things of this world and the things of your addiction and the things of your failing, and you now want to move heavenward and freedomward, then guess what you're going to do? You've got it by now. We're going to choose influences in harmony with that. It may mean new friends. It may mean new music. It may mean new places of entertainment and all the rest. But if we don't make those choices, friends, we're constantly going to be drawn back into a place of slavery and brokenness. Oh, this is a big principle that we all need to understand, friends, is that you need Jesus to be complete. You absolutely and desperately need Jesus to be complete. You know, one of the biggest things that drives people into the problem of addiction is that they're not satisfied with themselves. They're not satisfied with their lives. They're trying to do something either to dumb down the pain, some sort of, you know, uh, as it were, uh, local anesthetic, some sort of self-medication technique, trying to make myself feel different, see myself different, or even just forget about myself. Uh, we, we're often trying to escape from our problems. We're trying to create an alternate reality, if you like, a place where those problems don't exist and these people can't bother me, a place where I feel good about myself, where I feel all bright and shiny and sparkly and, and great about life. And, and, and we're doing this because we've removed God from our lives. You know, as I studied the Bible, I came to an interesting conclusion. When you look at the creation of man, according to Scripture, you will realize that he wasn't just created in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, and then they were left there. The Bible says that they were created there, and then God shared his presence with them. He visited them with, for, for a whole day on that seventh day of creation. In other words, that they had been designed for fellowship with God, not just for each other, not just to be doers and actors and creators and makers of things, but they were designed first and foremost for relationships, for meaningful relationships, and chief of all those relationships was their relationship with God. God has designed, built into humanity, a God-shaped vacuum, if you please, which only He can fill. And as long as we keep running from that design plan, as long as we keep denying that intention in our creation, what is going to happen? We're going to be trying to satisfy ourselves with, with one thing after the other, one party after the next, one substance after the next, etc., etc., etc. It will just keep going. We need to get to the point where we realize that we will only be complete in Jesus. Scripture puts it this way in Colossians 2 verses 8 to 10 where it says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. When you see that word beware on someone's front gate with a picture of a dog, you know you don't just rush in there. You know that when it says beware of dog that there's probably a big dog somewhere and so you're, you're going to rattle the gate, make a noise so that if that element of danger is there, he'll come rushing out while you're safely on this side of the gate. 
spiritually and philosoph philosophically, the Bible says, guess what? Beware, beware of dog. What is the dog? It is the dog of empty philosophy and empty deceit. He says, beware, there are ideas out there in the world that will cheat you. There are ideas out there that you can do it by yourself. There are ideas out there that you don't need God. There are ideas out there that, that you are somehow strong enough and that religion is a crutch for the weak. There, there, there are ideas out there that would want us to believe that humanity is all and in all, and that's all you need to know. Beware lest you are cheated. I was cheated for many years of my life, buying into all these worldly philosophies, trying to do it by myself. And eventually, after a long road of many, many years, I reached a point where I realized this philosophy, these deceits, are exactly what the Bible says. They are empty. They have no substance. They sound nice, and they tickle the ears of the one who wants to be autonomous and wants to be a law unto himself and doesn't want to be accountable to God or, or, or need to be depending on God. Well, if you're still at that point in your life, friends, you are just going to keep going in a vicious circle day after day, trying this philosophy, trying that deception, and it's just not going to work. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him, in God, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now this is good news. The one who we know is Jesus Christ, according to Scripture, has the fullness of divinity in Him. That means He is the Almighty Creator God. That means that when you are connected with Him, you are connected with the source of omnipotence. When you are connected with Jesus Christ, you have all power at your disposal by His grace. And that's why it says, in completing that concept, you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. When you find your connection with God, when you come into this saving relationship with God, you know what happens to you? You are connected with a source of power and you are made complete. You find that place of contentment and that place of fulfillment. And the result is that the powers of addiction and the powers of sin, they, the chains fall off because they've got no answering call within your heart. You've found that place of completeness in Christ. And of course, friends, tying very close with this, Scripture reveals one of the principles we need to know in overcoming challenges in our lives, and particularly addiction, is that we need peace with God. You know, it's a fact that so many people are often self-medicating themselves on various recreational drugs because they don't have peace ties in very similar with the principle before, uh, before this one. We are trying to numb down the pain. We're trying to numb down the fact that we don't like what we see in the moral compass and in the moral mirror of our soul. We just don't like what we see. And so we try to keep busy and, and keep partying and keep doing and we just don't want to slow down. We don't want the lights to go off. We don't want uh, the quietness to set in because we don't like what we see. And if that is what's motivating you, if that's what's driving you, if that's why you are self-medicating yourself through the process of, of substance abuse, then you first need to sort out the cause before you can deal with the symptoms and, and overcome the drugs itself. And what is the cause? You need peace with God. What is the promise of Scripture? How do I get this peace? How do I make right with God? 1 John 1 verse 9 says plainly that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that good news? What do you have to do to make right with God? What do you have to do to have peace with God? You have to climb the highest mountain or beat yourself 20 times with a leather whip to inflict pain to overcome. What do you have to do to make peace with God? Do you have to drive to the ends of the world? Do you have to go on some, some uh, uh, once a year or once every 10 year pilgrimage? to some faraway place, some holy shrine somewhere. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's as simple as going to God and saying with your mouth, acknowledging, I have sinned, I have fallen short, I have not measured up to your mark and to your level. Lord, I admit it. If you've ever been in a marriage relationship, you'll know you have to do that with your spouse every so often. Same concept. It's as simple as going to God. He knows you can do nothing in your own strength to atone for your wrongdoing. That's why He atoned for you in the person of Christ at the cross where He died in your behalf. He did that to pay your debt. He did that to set you free. He did that so that, so that you could know the joy of forgiveness and peace with God. How do I access that gift? How do I make it my own? Very simple. Confess your sin. Go to Him. Stop hiding from it. 
Pray to Him and talk to Him. Lay it before Him and let Him forgive your sin. You need peace with God, friends. And of course, last principle, seventh principle, you need to take action. It's not good enough to hear nice things and to have some, you know, awe-inspiring thoughts and some like aha moments, you know, to listen to lectures like this and go, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds great, that's logical, I bet you it's because I wasn't doing this and that's why, no, listen, you need to take the information and you need to make it a lifestyle. You need to take action. That's why in the Bible it puts it this way, in James 1 verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Ah, you see what that's saying? When you only listen, even if you acknowledge that, yes, this is truth, even if you acknowledge, yes, I know what I'm hearing is the right thing, but you don't take action, all you're doing is deceiving yourself. You are thinking that you are growing. You are thinking that you've got it now, that the information circle has come complete. But unless you take action, it's a state of self-deception. Knowing it but not living it is not going to help anyone, least of all you. So what do, what do we want to do? We want to take these principles which we have been studying throughout this Beyond Addiction series and the ones yet to come, and we want to make it a matter of practical reality. Go and rearrange your schedule. You know, if, if we're talking about spiritual commitment, Block off time during the day, in the morning and the evening, for time spent in the Word, in the Bible, in Scripture. Because if, if part of uh, overcoming addiction is knowing the promises of God and being able to apply them, then you have to find them. So block off time in your day. It may mean a choice b uh, about spending less time in front of the television. It may mean that, uh, uh, as we've spoken about some of the physiological aspects of healing in previous episodes, it may mean scheduling exercise. It may mean learning a few new recipes and moving away from the old foodstuffs over to the new foodstuffs. You see, we need to actually take action on the things that we have learned and that we are, are, are hoping will make a difference in our lives. You've got to take action. Principles from God's Word summarized are as follow. Number one, the mindset, the knowledge by faith that you can overcome. Number two, we want to be looking for God's escape route when we face a situation of temptation because He has promised to make an escape route. Number three, we need God's power because we don't have that kind of power inside of ourselves. Number four, we need to make choices about surrounding ourselves with new influences. Number five, we need Jesus in our lives to be complete, a surrender to Him, a giving of ourselves over to Him. Number six, we need peace with God through the forgiveness of our sins. And number seven, we need to take action and make these ideas, these philosophies, these principles a practical reality in our everyday life. Build them into our, into our schedules on a daily basis. The bottom line, friends, is really quite simple. In Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. What makes sense to you? Conventional wisdom. Don't just rely on the knowledge that science provides and what may seem right and logical and what you would like to believe. But what does it say? First and foremost, trust in the Lord. Then in all your ways, acknowledge Him. What does that mean? It means the choices you make in daily life. Ask yourself, is this what God would have me to do? Am I ordering my life, whether it's in my business affairs or whether it's in my home life or whatever it is, am I ordering my affairs after the order of God's Word and the principles contained in there. That's what it means to acknowledge Him in all our ways. That every area of our life, we want to put Him first and make Him number one. And the promise then is, when we do this, He shall direct our paths. Through those promises of the Word in which uh, we prioritize our life and shape our life, His guidance will be seen. When we trust in Him, we do not lean on our own understanding and our own logic. Where our ideas conflict with His ideas, we choose his ideas and submit to them. We acknowledge him in all our ways, putting into action the principles of God's word. The assurance is that he will be there at every step of the way to guide our paths. Isn't that good news, friends? That you and I, through the presence of the Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ in our lives, are assured of divine guidance to overcome every weakness in our lives. I want to challenge you to make God number one, to make Him the priority of your life. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, will you bless the viewer? Will you help them, Lord, that they may know your goodness and your grace and your mercy? Will you bless them with the reality of your promises fulfilled? Will you help them to put into action the things that we have studied in this presentation? 
For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.